Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and welcome to the latest in our series of Doha debates sponsored here in the Gulf by the Qatar Foundation. Extremism takes many forms. At its worst, it encourages and actively supports violence of the kind seen in America on 9-11 and in London on the July 7th bombings in 2005. After these and other incidents, many blamed Islamic extremists and asked whether Muslim communities around the world had done all they could to prevent such attacks. Others insisted the real fault lay with Western policies, particularly towards Israel and Iraq. So tonight we debate this highly controversial issue with the motion, this House believes that Muslims are failing to combat extremism. And we have some influential voices on our panel. Speaking for the motion, Ed Hussein, who brings some unusual experience to the discussion. At the age of 16, he became, as he puts it, an Islamic fundamentalist in Britain. He was even a campus recruiter for Islamist groups until he rejected them at the age of 21. He's now deputy director of the Muslim counter-extremism group, the Quilliam Foundation, and is a frequent commentator on the topic. Also for the motion, Arsalan Iftikhar, a human rights lawyer and contributing editor to Islamica magazine, an international publication aimed at widening understanding of Islam. Until last year, he was national legal director for the Council on American Islamic Relations, the largest Muslim civil rights organization in the U.S. Well, speaking against the motion, Daisy Khan, she's executive director of the American Society for Muslim Advancement. She's launched women and youth programs, and she advises young Muslims on such things as assimilation and modernity. She's also won numerous awards for promoting peace and interfaith dialogue. And with her, the Muslim televangelist Moez Masood, who is known to millions throughout the Arab world for the controversial issues that he tackles. As a day job, though, he's an advertising executive, producing commercials. He also releases songs and promotes what one observer called sweet orthodoxy, which stresses the humane and compassionate. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel. And now let me call first on Ed Hussein, please, to speak for the motion. Thank you, Tim. Ladies and gentlemen, I was born and raised in London, but at the age of 16, my world changed. At the outset, at school, I was introduced to literature from people such as Sayyid Qutb and Maududi, and gradually, the people I, I kept company with, the group I hang out with, changed my mind to the extent, based on the literature that I was reading from those individuals and others, that I started to disagree fundamentally with my parents' kind of Islam. My neighbors were increasingly seen in my mind as kuffar. The language of jihad that was put out in those books with the language that I increasingly used myself on college campuses up and down Britain. Several years later, on my own college campus, that rhetoric of unfettered jihad, of looking down at the other as kuffar, and disliking fellow Muslims, seeing them as several cuts beneath myself, led to a murder on my college campus. It was that murder that changed my mind and led to my leaving extremism, and then I traveled the Muslim world. I spent a lot of time in Damascus and later Saudi Arabia. But what worried me was the very literature that had indoctrinated me and the groups that I kept company with were also present here in the Middle East. Hearing Friday sermons at, at, at uh, uh, mosques in Mecca, Medina and Jeddah were deeply worrying. When I went back to Britain in 2005, those very books that had radicalized me, those very groups that had damaged my life in my teens and early 20s were still active on university campuses. And it worries me today as I sit here in a city like Qatar that it's home to a leading scholar who, without any reservations, gives endorsement for suicide bombings, killing of innocent people in, in, in the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's that double standard that we apply. It's that disregard for innocent human life that worries me deeply. And I sit here today and implore on you to make sure that at the end of this debate you vote for the right side and you vote and you be honest with ourselves and, and, and say out loud... That's enough of burying our heads in the sand, and it's high time that we admitted that the nature of the problem and that we Muslims thus far have not done enough to combat extremism. Ed Hussein, thank you very much indeed. Ever since the attacks, the major attacks, 9-11, 7-7 in London, Muslims have marched, Muslims have condemned violence, uh, they've issued fatwas. What more do you expect them to do? Uh, from where I sit, I don't see deep, sincere moral outrage. The fact that cleric but after cleric... they've expressed that time and again on television, in newspapers, in articles, in letters written by 
by where, clerics. Where are, where, where are the vast demonstrations against the killings in Iraq on a daily basis between Shia and Sunni Muslims? Where are the vast demonstrations against clerics who are issuing fatwas of suicide bombing and thus endorsing the killing of innocent human beings? I don't see those mass protests on our streets. Yes, the odd fatwa here and the odd fatwa there. But that said, I must play, uh, pay tribute at this point to the good work done by people like Sheikh Ali Jumma, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, Habib Ali al-Jifri, they're the good guys, but they're the exception. The vast majority of the Muslim street thus far hasn't risen up in the numbers that it should against the moral outrage that we see happening all around us. But by telling Muslims you have to do more, do more, do more, this constant refrain, prove that you're not terrorists, prove that you don't have links with extremists, you risk... Um, Pushing them into but, a but, corner, but, don't but you? It's, it's not about doing more. Marginalizing no, it's not, them it's not in society. About, it's not about doing more. It's probably about doing less of certain things. The fact that after 9-11 in 2001, there were only about 13,000 madrasas in Pakistan teaching extremist Islam, and now we have 25,000, that tells you a lot. The fact that report after report shows that the vast majority of Muslims don't see a clash between extremism and moderate Islam, that also tells you something. So... It's, it's about doing less, I think, rather than doing more. And aren't you providing the excuse for racial profiling and for marginalizing Muslims? Far from it. I'm on the record f as being against all of those things. And I don't think it's about racial profiling Muslims, but it's about racial profiling... But some profiling. people might say you're scaremongering about the community. There's just a tiny minority of people who are involved in extremist activities. I wish it were a tiny minority. When I was involved in extremism in the 1990s, there were about 200 of us in Britain. Now the official figures are over 4,000 people that MI5 is looking at today. So the numbers, sadly, are on the increase. And the fact that we've had huge, huge attacks, such as 9-11, 7-7, Bali, the, uh, the conflict in Iraq, just indicates that the problem where it was rhetorical in the 1990s has now become practical and you know, it's become the default violent culture among people who have grievances based on religion and politics. All right, Ed Hussain, thank you very much indeed. Now let me call, please, on Daisy Khan to speak against the motion. I am rejecting this motion because I'm part of the combat team that is working against extremism. And soon you will see a tidal wave of visionary Muslim thought and activism mounting on the horizon, which will change the face and focus of Muslim life worldwide. This change is already here. Extremism is found in all religions and ideologies, and unfortunately, Islam is no exception. But I'm here to share the good news with you today, that an era of extremism is over almost over. Fortunately, extremists in the Muslim world are a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. But sadly, the media has continually amplified and neglected the peaceful efforts of the silent majority. For instance, last month, 10,000 Muslim ulema and others in India denounced the tactics used by the extremists. In 2004 in Jordan, Amman message signed by 184 eminent clerics, rejected takfir, proclaiming others as infidels, and it barely got a mention. These initiatives that take back Islam from the extremists is big news, but our news media is more interested in what is the latest gossip on Britney Spears. No wonder there is a perception that Muslims are twitching their thumbs and doing nothing. When I say a tidal wave is mounting on the horizon, I am not saying this lightly. I am part of this tidal wave. Three years ago, I knew that my way of combating extremism was showing success, small successes. I felt a personal burden to continue and had to leave my very nice, cushy corporate job of an interior architect, and I began to empower agents of change. Muslim women and young Muslim men and women leaders. Before you vote, I ask you to think about one thing. Do not forget the tireless effort of ordinary combatants like myself and others here in this room who are fighting extremism without ever raising a sword, using a stick, a stone, a bullet, or a bomb. This peaceful tactic led by visionary men and women leaders, are forming the tidal wave, the wave that will push away all remnants of extremism once and for all. Thank you. Daisy Khan, the era of extremism is over. You seem to live on another planet from Ed Hussain. Ed yes. Hussain sees the same people radicalizing fresh generations of youth in Britain. He sees books being sold outside mosques calling for the death of non-believers, and you say the era of extremism is over. How can you? I'm here to tell you that Muslims are doing enough, 
That and is enough if those books are still being sold outside mosques in London. That's enough. That's if you want to measure success as what is the win. Successes are small successes that lead to the big success. But this doesn't and worry you at all? that is what I want all? to focus on. This, these things don't worry you at all? These things don't worry me because I am seeing a new era approaching. And the era of extremism is over. Based Whether on it's what? Muslim, how, how are you seeing a new era? Because polls, when these people are still polls after polls putting will tell out the same that, propaganda. Polls after polls will tell you that the general public has no appetite for extremism anymore. Extremists have not done anything for society. If anything, they have set back our society. And it's time well, for all you, of us you to mention rise polls, but take over. Let me mention a poll to you. After, after the 7-7 bombings in London, 79% of Muslims thought their community should be more responsible for preventing Muslims from becoming bombers. So they see a gap there. They don't think that Muslims in their communities are doing enough to prevent these bombers coming out. But you ignore that. Well, it's if you are waiting for somebody else to create the team, uh, uh, change, Tim. I mean, ordinary people have to take back the responsibility, and that's what I'm doing. I'm talking about the work that I'm doing. And I, and I know many other efforts that are going on all over the world that are really contributing to us pushing back extremism once and for all. Daisy Khan, thank you very much indeed. Now, please, could I call on Asalan Iftikhar to speak for the motion. Thank you, Tim. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and assalamu alaikum. This motion should be voted for for three major reasons. Number one, and first and foremost, it is a religious, spiritual, and moral obligation for us Muslims to self-reflect and speak out against injustice wherever it occurs, and most importantly, who, uh, regardless of whoever the perpetrator is. We must clean our own house first, before we can expect others to have any sort of sympathy for our causes. Secondly, we've also lost credibility with the rest of the world because of our selective outrage. And the reason that I call it selective moral outrage is because we see protests and riots going on during the Danish cartoon controversy with Gillian Gibbons, the English teacher in Sudan, who was almost imprisoned and given lashes for uh, innocently naming a teddy bear, uh, Muhammad. But we don't see those same sorts of vocal protests. We do not see that same moral outrage when we see our Sunni and Shia brothers and sisters being slaughtered every single day, when we look at political assassinations in Pakistan, when we look at the fact that out of 57 majority Muslim nations on earth, only one in four of our nations are democratically elected. And so there has become a socio-political vacuum, which of course leads to my third point, that we as a Muslim ummah, as a Muslim community, seem to not be able to differentiate between something that is a political grievance and a religious justification. The real difference between those who condone terrorist acts and all others is about politics and not piety. Two wrongs do not make a right. Islam does not teach us that. And we, the, the great American civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we will have to repent in this generation, not only for the actions and words of bad people, but also for the appalling silence of good people. And as someone who has dedicated his life to Islamic work, I honestly believe that my Muslim and bro brothers and sisters around the world need to change this appalling silence and help make our community better for all. Asala Niftika, thank you very much indeed. What more would you do personally? Well, I per you, you say Muslims are failing to combat extremism, what more would you do? Personally? Well, I, I think that what, for example, what all of us here at this table have done is, you know, we have gotten out into the public domain. I think one of the... Yes, but what more? You've been out on the public, exactly. Right. You, well, I, I think that one you of the... voiced your condemnation of right. terrorist activities. But what that, more? But we can tell that that's not having a resonating effect when 24% of Americans say that they do not want Muslims as their neighbors, when 49% of Americans, according to a Gallup poll, say that Islam inherently is more of a violent religion than other religions. We're, uh, but is it your fault that that attitude has taken It is away? our collective fault. And as a Muslim, as a part of the global ummah, as a part of the global Muslim community, we all have to accept responsibility because these are people who are claiming to act in the name of our faith. And it is high time for us to stand up and as loudly as they say it, we must say that this will not be done in our name. So more outrage, more condemnation. Absolutely. We, we should Why do you hold Muslims to a higher standard than everybody else in because, society? Because I am a Muslim and because Islam holds Muslims to a higher standard. If nobody else is going to take the moral high ground on issues, it is the Islamic teachings of God and the Prophet Muhammad that we must take the moral high ground and, and 
bring justice and about. watch out for extremists in their midst. Absolutely. So spy on their own society. Well, no, I mean, you call a spade a spade regardless of where... So you spy on your own society. You've got to look over your shoulder the whole time, wonder what everybody's doing. Well, is, you, that, is that the kind of Muslim community you want? No, of course not, but you always look over your shoulder to find out if anything bad is happening behind you. You don't look at the, the color or the, the religion of the person who might be doing you harm. Again, justice is justice regardless of who is the oppressor and who is the oppressed. Asalan Iftikhar, thank you very much indeed. Now let me please call on Moaz Masood to speak against the motion. I believe um, the truth or the reality of the matter is that Muslims are not failing uh, to combat extremism. I believe there certainly is a perception that Muslims are failing to combat extremism. I fully agree with that. And one of the things I want to do tonight is make that clear distinction between the currently existing perception and between the reality and I'm going to have to put the spotlight on another, a whole bunch of other things that people haven't been seeing. Um, one m very important point here is that I'd also want to make here is that uh, this is not a new thing. We had to deal as Muslims before 9-11 with acts of extremism, with terrorism particularly. I would like to quickly cite the assassination of our president, me being an Egyptian, Sadat. And I would like to say that that was extremism that befell us before anyone else. And by 1997, because of a lot of efforts to combat extremism, and we can get into details later, uh, this group, Jama'a Islamiyah, renounced violence. And uh, later on, a series of books called Tasheeh al-Mafahim, the correction of certain understandings, were actually issued. And that was, I think, a very important success. And this is all before, uh, or most of it, at least before 9-11. I also want to talk about how the orthodox and authoritative understanding of Islam is the majority. And I also want to show that it's not very silent. I would disagree with uh, my colleagues here regarding the silence of that majority. I believe that radical Islam does exist, but I also believe it's a minority. That's why I'm on this side. But I believe that it has the microphone, and so it has an amplified voice, and that the media keeps putting the limelight on them. And this is one of the responsibilities of the media that we want to get into, I think, in this debate. And uh, I believe that scholars have uh, spoken, authoritative scholars who can prove their authenticity, have been speaking out and are speaking out and can clearly show that there is no, um, nothing inherent in Islam that would justify terrorism and that it is completely antithetical to the teachings of this tradition that, um, to speak and respond to Ed, that maybe what you say is to me a perfect analysis of a non-representative sample which is the UK. Wise um, Masood, yeah. thank you very much indeed. Um, you look at Ed Hussein's experience and you say it's not representative, small numbers. That's complacency, isn't it? That's pretty close to complacency. It doesn't matter whether the numbers are small or large. It matters what damage they can cause in society, doesn't it? Well, no, absolutely. I mean, the second part, at least, it, it's about the damage. But all I'm saying is that when to draw a conclusion about an entire civilization would need a representative sample, I think that the UK, or Muslims in the UK, I think it's a very unique situation that doesn't represent Muslims anywhere else in the world. So you're concerned about the situation of Muslims I'm very in the much UK. concerned. That's why I feel... And, and it's uh, failing in, in the UK, is it? I, if this was only about in the UK, maybe I would have been on Ed's side, possibly. I would need to do some more research. So, but are, so, so you would go halfway towards their side? No, I think the UK represents a less smaller percentage of the world, but I would go maybe 10% or 5%. But the that. same kind of literature calling for the death of non-believers that's outside, being sold outside a mosque yeah. that, that's Saudi Arabia. in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia or in London, well, you, you don't condemn that? I do, and I think that Saudi Arabia and the UK, that would be the Western example and the anomaly, and this would be the Arab anomaly. Do you know what kind of literature is being sold outside your mosque? In Egypt? Yes. I think very uh, spiritual literature, personally. I come from a mosque called, uh, by my house called Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet. They're known to be a lot more. Have you, have you looked at the literature? Personally, the one sold by my mosque, yeah. Yeah, you've looked at it and it doesn't contain any exhortations to kill non-believers. No, I think that the kind of extremism or the kind of concern that I would have with the non-anomalous areas, which I still believe are a majority, would be about sympathy maybe, but not perpetrating acts of violence or calling them justified. All right, Maiz Masood, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to throw the uh, questions open to the floor. Our motion being this House believes that Muslims are failing to combat extremism. Um, let's take a gentleman in the first row. Uh, don't you think that the, the, uh, the Western uh, societies, they are not helping Muslims in order to fight against terrorism or the you know, extremism? 
Okay, well, let's have Ed Hussain answer that question. Are they helping? Uh, this is part of the mentality that constantly shifts the blame to the other, that somehow the West has got something to do with it. This is our problem. No, we're this, trying, if, we're if trying, I may, but if, I mean, if, if, if I may. Can, they're can, actually you, let him, can you let him finish? If, if, if I may, it, it was in the 18th century that the, 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 the roots of this problem started in Najd, when one man decided that with him and his tribe they will oust everyone else who opposes them. What we see in the heartland of Islam, Mecca and Medina today, is the kind of extremism that I'm talking about that doesn't tolerate the other, even within our faith. So the, the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia can't tolerate the, the, the Sunni Sufis or the Shia, never mind the non-Muslim infidel that, that resides elsewhere. So for me, it's about becoming more tolerant within the Muslim tradition and then extending that tolerance outside. So let's put our house in order first before we constantly blame the other. But we're not blaming, we're just saying that they are not helping us. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that you guys agree with me. They're not helping. If they're invading Iraq, if they're, you know, also saying that, the, you know, the United Nations, you know, using the veto against the United Nations, condemning uh, the siege against Gaza, these are the things that are, uh, you know, striving the, the, the local communities in different countries. Okay, and, 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 and as, as, as a Muslim public diplomat who, who deals with all of these issues, this, this begins to get into the debate of moral equivocation, where I, I said before, two wrongs do not make a right. If I come to you and I slap you in the face, that gives you no right to go and slap Ed in the face. We, we have, you know, as Muslims, we have a religious obligation in Islam to, to not only help our oppressed brothers, but also call out our brothers when they are being the oppressors. You know, we all know the, the Bukhari tradition of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, help your brother whether he's an oppressor or the oppressed. But we tend to only focus on the oppressed and we take a blind eye when Muslims around the world are claiming to make act and do acts and perform acts in the name of Islam and then say, oh, but we're doing it because of something that's going on halfway around okay, the world. I'm going to take a quick uh, comment from Daisy Khan. Yeah, I think we really have to know what the root cause of extremism is. 90% of extremism comes about because people are looking for either political liberation or some kind of self-determination. Not, it's not about the theology of Islam. Right. That is not what we're debating here today. And I think that only 10% is about social justice, which really means, you know, political empowerment and, and economic empowerment. They, they, there was they, no extremism in no. Afghanistan before the Soviets it, walked in. Let me finish. Let economy. me give you some stats. There was no extremism in Iraq. Please, very, very briefly. Before we walked in there, Senator Obama said the other day that, you know, George Bush drove the bus into the ditch, and now everybody else has to get the bus out. And then, if we go into Iran tomorrow, you can be rest assured that there will be rise of extremism in Iran also. All so right. we have to take some responsibility as Western Muslims as well. And to say, do you want that, to come back very is, briefly on that? Uh, sure. It's I mean, a reaction very to a lot of I, political upheaval. With respect, it's not fair to say that the theology doesn't have anything to do with it when repeatedly suicide bombers are talking about going into Jannah and sharing their lives with the 72 virgin wives. We've got to be honest and say there is a misreading of theology, of scripture here, that contributes to the political grievances that you rightly, rightly right. adhere to. Thank you. I'm going to take a question from the lady in the third row. There, we'll get a microphone to you, please. Why would we label these people suicide bombers when their enemies are being supplied with F-16s and Apaches? And they're bombing them every day. What other alternative do, the, do these people have? This is the question. If you try to liberate the people that are doing that and give them their rights, they will not resort to such a thing. They don't have any other alternative. I would ask you a simple question in response. Is there a categorical prohibition of suicide in Islam? Is, is, there, is there any... Of suicide it, bombing. No, no, just of, of suicide in general. I mean, getting assigned to, to the bomb. There, it, is, it is categorical. See, we're not condoning suicide. It is haram in Islam. We understand that. But they are in a situation where we have to understand fiqh al -waqa. This is a reality of the situation. What alternative do they have? So you, you, this just, is what you, I'm asking. You're not condoning right. suicide. I, I, well, you, you just, These are under, under other... You're not condoning it, but are you justifying a, it? If we, no, we're not justifying anything. If these were in Vietnam or if these were in any other country, they would do the same thing. Again, you, and this has happened all over history. You can find it. If they're freedom fighters, they need a way out. Okay, let's ask We're Moaz not Masoud. condoning well, violence, we're not Moaz condoning Masoud suicide. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, talking from within a Muslim paradigm now to respond to this kind of question. The orthodox standpoint is anti-suicide, the orthodox standpoint is anti the killing of civilians, and the orthodox standpoint is anti-suicide 
for the purpose of killing of civilians. Now, some people might emotionally have the tendency to hear this as an apathy towards the Palestinian people, but those who take this standpoint actually are trying to do what will supposedly bring God's blessing into the area. And so I think that, again, it's just we're going back to the point that the orthodox understanding of Islam doesn't have enough light on it, and nobody's speaking uh, its language to the people and then all we have right now is a radical minority with loud voices and then confused masses with emotions and they're just going at each other. I think it's time okay. for Islam to speak about Islam. All right, let's take a question from the lady on the fourth row there, please. Um, good evening. Uh, my question is to the panel against the motion and uh, I really do not mean to underestimate the efforts of everyone fighting extremism but I'd like to take you to the situation in Iraq and we view uh, the Muslim community over there killing each other and uh, the global Muslim community is very much expected to react in a certain way that matches the, the severity of the situation in Iraq and we haven't seen that from the global Muslim society. Daisy Khan. Well, I think that ordinary citizens have to step up. And unfortunately, I think it's ordinary Iraqis that have to come together and ask but for a stop are, to violence. But they are coming together. I know that for sure. And I speak that from experience because I'm Iraqi, but we still don't see a reaction from the Muslim society. They're not, I feel sometimes that they don't Look, fight I it can, as much as they fight other issues like, like the Denmark the, the, the cartoons right. in Denmark, for example. I know that the Shia and the Sunni community in America is getting together to make sure that this does not, this conflict does not travel into America and tear apart another community. If All right, you Asalan like Iftika, you yeah. wanted to say something. Well, again, getting, getting back to my central point, I think that we as Muslims are failing in the sense that, that we are not, our, our selective outrage, again, like you mentioned, the Danish cartoon controversy, you know, we had fire bombings and riots in Beirut, Islamabad, and Kuala Lumpur. Where are those same, where are those same protests? Where are, the, where, are the, where are the chanting Muslims saying no to sectarian violence that's, in Iraq? That's my point exactly. Ex well, yes. and that's, again, as someone who has dedicated his life not only to combating extremism, but to also combating Islamophobia, because we have to understand that when people in the West, when non-Muslims view and, and see our selective outrage, they are less likely to show any sort of sympathy when we do need the, the moral outrage, when we do need the All consensus right. of the global community. Okay, there's a lady in the sixth, seventh row. You've had your hand up for a while. Uh, to, the, uh, to the side that says Arabs are doing, um, Muslims are doing enough for this, define enough. What to you is enough to stop this? If we hear different sides. We hear you saying there's a lot and him saying a little, but numbers don't matter. It's a problem and we need to face it, whether it's a tiny problem or it's a big problem. So what do you think, what, what, what do you think that we're doing that's actually enough to prevent well, it? I just l want to reiterate one last time. I never said we're doing enough. I think until it's solved, we haven't done enough because I, as a Muslim, it's my responsibility to completely eradicate it. Let's be honest, there's a huge conspiracy mindset going up and down the Arab Muslim street that believes that somehow Jews and the CIA were behind 9-11 and 7-7 and Muslims had nothing to do with it. We've got to get beyond this sort of... That's a, uh, and that's conspiracy, denial, that's a good point. But, but, that, that's widespread. But what is, that, widespread. No, but what is that conspiracy Mossad's point? Mossad's responsible. 3,000 Jews didn't turn up. We've got to accept responsibility for where we are collectively as a community. And once we've done that, and hopefully tonight's motion will be passed, because uh, that, that, that admits that we've got a problem, then we can start talking about what to do about it. Okay, gentleman in the third row, we'll take a question from you, please. Mrs. Khan, you said earlier that um, we need the average Muslim population. They need to step up to help combat extremism. Well, what can the average Muslim person do to help combat this? I have a five-point point strategy. We Muslims take pride in our five pillars. We love our five pillars, and we do them really well. But we also have another dimension which is how to take care of our fellow citizens. And what is it that we need to do? I have a five-part plan. We need to cultivate new leaders, new leaders who will instill hope and inspire others. You have to befriend the West, my friends. The West is no longer of the other. I am part of the West. There are 25 million Muslims living in the West. You have to empower women. They are the glue that hold the community together and the family together. And women have the most to gain by eradicating extre extremism. Wives, mothers, and sisters don't have to weep anymore in silence because they've lost their husbands, sons, and brothers. And you have to help Muslims 
who are working against extremism if you have resources. And I say, just give one dollar for every Muslim who's not an extremist. Okay. Give it to me or give it to any one of us, and you will see a change. Right, Fifth. It's last Fifth. point. Last yes, point. and this okay. is the one that everybody can do. Mm -hmm. Reclaim the ummah for peace and justice and, repla and replace it by reporting criminal activity in your own community. Don't be afraid to do that. All right. Gentleman in the front row. You, sir. Uh, my question is for Mrs. Khan. Uh, you say that 90% of extremists are uh, ex that they're extremists because they're looking for political freedom, right? So Mr. Hussein said that uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, the center of the Islamic world, we have people selling magazines calling for the death of non-believers. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that there is a, um, the truth of Islam has been hijacked by people who have a, a distorted uh, um, view of scripture. And I believe that, that is, uh, there is work to be done in that area. And what would you do about that kind of literature being sold in Saudi Arabia? I think that we really that? need to take a serious look at that because we in the United States... What does States, that mean, take a serious look at it? We have suffered Read from it? that in the United States because the verse says non-believers and then in parentheses it says Jews and but, Christians. But, 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 That's well, you, not you, a non-believer you, that, you say that every year millions of Muslims go to Hajj and we walk away silently. There's no protest against the fact that the Saudis have totally demolished our heritage in Mecca and Medina. There's no protest about the fact that they impose a certain sexual, sexual segregation in, in the Haram in Medina and in the Haram in Mecca. I feel collectively we're responsible for what's going on in our heartland from where we send our ambassadors on a yearly basis, unless we challenge it at, right there. Okay, well, lady in the second row, we'll take a question from you, please. Good evening. My question is to Mr. Arsalan. When the Danish government eventually met with the Muslims in Denmark, they chose only to meet with the modern Muslim. Isn't some of the extremism in Islam are the results of frustration born out of the West desire to have a dialogue only on its own terms? Thank you. That's actually a very good question. On the day the Danish cartoon controversy broke, I personally met with both the Danish and Norwegian ambassador to the United States to voice my opposition to it. And of course, during the time, the newspaper was hiding behind the free press argument, but we all learned later through the Guardian newspaper in the United Kingdom that they had turned down similar cartoons lampooning uh, the prophet Jesus. And so this was an incendiary, insightful message that they were trying to send to the Muslim world. And unfortunately, some Muslims around the world took the bait hook, line, and sinker. And that's where we saw a firebombing of a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Beirut, a bombing of a Pizza Hut in Islamabad, Pakistan, and the, the difficulty that I had, you know, I, I go from CNN to BBC to Al Jazeera explaining these situations, and the first question that I get, and it's a question that I think all of you should think about, is that what about the virulently anti-Semitic cartoons that regularly appear in Muslim newspapers around the world? So if we are going to condemn racism, we should not only condemn Islamophobia, we have to condemn racism in all of its forms, especially within our own Muslim ummah, whether saying that Arabs are better than non-Arabs, we, we have to be consistent in our message because otherwise to the rest of the world, we're just seen as duplicitous Muslims who only cry foul when something goes wrong with us and not when our people do something wrong. All right, wrong noise Masood. Well. There are efforts, they are very substantial, they represent orthodox Islam, we need to get more media light onto them. Until the media is on them, the media light, we currently are going to have okay. people believing the other image in the media, hence your statistics. All right, we're going to take a question from the gentleman in the second row, please. Yes, uh, hi, my question goes to the opposition. Why don't the Muslims, like yourself, leading agencies that promote non-killing, go as far as maybe halfway around the world to Pakistan and stop, the, uh, stop like, schools there from teaching children at a young age that maybe if you um, uh, perform jihad, that will get, you uh, it will get you straight to heaven? Why don't you go as far as to halfway around the world to change it and not only stick to the West? I mean, it takes a lot of measures to stop extremism because you said yourself it's a very deep problem. Well, can. I, I guess I'm headed to Pakistan next. Uh, <laughs> thank you. My, my work is very extensive. I do go all over the place, but I will take your uh, proposition very seriously. Yes, and I would like to add to that that no, we are. We are. People are flying there. We are. We're getting rid of this literature. Those efforts that have been unknown are coming out now. 
And it's because of them that I'm saying we're not failing. And hopefully we will succeed maybe the next Doha debate. Moise talked about perception. We all know that perception is reality. When one, for, when one fourth of a nation thinks that you are too dangerous to live next door to, it is quite clear that we are not succeeding in getting our message across. All right, Moise Masoud. The, the common word uh, message, which is an effort by 138 fully representative across the board Muslim scholars, leaders, are meeting with Christian leaders to commit to the fact that they're based on love thy God and love thy neighbor. That's just one effort today that no one knows anything about. But if they don't know about it, does it make a difference? Well, that's the thing. Then, then instead of saying we're failing, we can say, look, we haven't succeeded yet. Now let's tell people about all these other things and make orthodoxy mainstream. All right. We're going to take the question from the gentleman up there. Maybe Muslims are failing to combat extremism because they're combating their real enemies. America's, America's problem is combating extremism. We're not suffering from extremism as America does. Do, so do you have a question? So yeah, that's, that's my comment. But I'm, I'm saying that what else should America do to combat extremism? This is the question, what, not what Muslims should do. Thank right. you. Well, what, what America is doing is that we are going to elect a new president in 2009 that is not George W. Bush. Now, in, in, in the same light, in the same breath that I condemn Osama bin Laden, I have been the first one to condemn George W. Bush for all of his catastrophic policies that he's undertaken. And, and that's the thing. It's not like you're, it's not the Bushian doctrine of you're either with us or you're against us. You know, most of the world, like, we, we see all different colors of the rainbow here tonight. You know, we, we represent all different backgrounds, all different faiths. You know, we, we, we have lost this culture of humanity. We are a global community. We, we, we must, you know, if my brother commits, you know, an act that is wrong, I must call, I have the responsibility to call him out on that. But we are going to elect a new hey, president say, in 2009. You want to say just on the back of what Arsalan has said, it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, for all of America's faults, that this problem started at home among us here in the Muslim East, and it's for us to sort out. And don't forget, going back 1,400 years, our Prophet said to us, that beware of extremism in your faith. So it's a reality that's always been there. And in the Quran, Allah talks about this religion being rahmat lil alamin, or the, or the carrier of this faith, the Prophet being a mercy to the world. So it's the onus is on us to sort out our houses, and rather than, you know, this, this Arabic phrase that I picked up in Damascus, lom al akhirin, the blame on the others all the time. We've got to change that mindset, and unless we do that, we will continue to be the laughing stock of the world. Tonight is your chance to actually start the ball rolling in the opposite direction. All right, I'm going to move on to a question from the gentleman in the third row there, please. This is just for uh, Brother Iftikhar. Uh, I think you, uh, Muslims in America have lived in America for the last 18 years, and I think they're doing an awesome job. But don't you, you, to, to me, it seems like you're trying to have the people here today uh, put in their minds very strongly that 25% of Americans who say that they are not they don't like to live next to a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Don't you think uh, those are the, just the people who regularly listen to people like Rush Limbo, um, Hannity, uh, Michael Savage, uh, all this media who has actually done the American people themselves, and I'm one of them myself, a disservice by trying to actually undo the good things that Muslims all over the world who are against extremism and terrorism are trying to do, and this is my question. The, the, the heart of the matter that I was trying to get at is that one in four Americans, so we have about 350 people here tonight. What if 75 to 80 of them said that they do not want to live next to a Pakistani or a Sudanese or a Shia? Would we say that's an insignificant portion of, of, of this populace? One-fourth of a nation of 300 million is not something that can be ignored. And so we have to look at the magnitude of the problem. It's, it's not one in a hundred, it's one in four. So for, for four of us, if we were all Americans and non-Muslims, one of us wouldn't want you as a neighbor. Okay. And I find that problematic. All right. I, I, I do agree with that, but, but let me take take it to the other side, because they are saying we are not failing. We're just taking it to the other or side. Or the people at least. Okay, yeah. you, you take well, it from there. Thank you. Don't ignore, but ask why. 
That's the whole point. Again, I just, you want to get to the meat of the matter, we have to be very practical. The meat of the matter is going back to Orthodox Islam. The reason is that extremism is an idea. You can't get rid of it. You have to get rid of the idea itself. You can't just get rid of the I, act. I, I, I totally, totally agree with your prognosis to the situation that it's a return to Orthodox, classical, Good. normative, traditional Islam. However, the big caveat is this, that we're up against a machine which functions in various countries known as the Saudi Embassy, Rabbit al Alam al-Islami, which is pumping in millions of dollars over, this, over the last two, two, three decades, which we're not up against. Yes, I accept as so and Zaytuna, but so we have to be open and say finish? Medina University is doing a lot of damage, which may well be undoing much of the good work that as and Zaytuna are doing but out. So unless we go, we, you know, it's all well and good being positive, yes, yes, but we've also got to be negative and say, there's the nub of the problem, guys. Let me ask and unless you, we're open about that, I'm, I'm sorry, I, and I fully, around the issue. And I agree with you, and let me ask you, so who's doing more right now? The radicals doing the damage or the orthodox institutions who are doing the repairing? What do you think? Right now the jury's out. It remains to be seen in 10 years' time which side wins. Well, so therefore then this motion can't really be voted for. Well, no, it can because if you look at it, the, the radicals are the ones who are getting, they're, they're, the get, they're getting the airtime. Well, Again, it, but see, uh, well, but, that but, takes but, us back to a non-representative sample with well, a loud voice. But Moise... Perception is reality. Is the, there, hold on. The, the rest of the non-Muslim world is, un, is woefully undereducated and ignorant about Islam. And so when they see olive-skinned males with beards and turbans toting AK-47s talking about how they want to kill the infidels, you know, they might not have any negative pre preconceptions about Muslims, but I assure you, once you see that on the evening broadcast every single night, you're going to start to think, maybe I don't want to be around these people. Then put this orthodoxy on the broadcast every single night. That's, exactly. that's what we're doing and calling for. I think there's a major shift going on here, and that is why I said I think the era of extremism is over. And I'm not saying it's over, over, over. I'm saying it's over. What's in the terms difference? Of, well, there's a graph. <laughs> What's the difference? One's three, it's, one's one. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a blip. It's waning. It's going down. This is why they are raising the I mean, over means, means finished. Whether what you I'm repeat saying it three is times that, or say it once. The, the, what I'm saying is that the, the Arab prisons, this is the first the Arab media. Prisons, the Arab prisons are full of extremists. I know that. Western intelligence is busy hunting these guys down, up and down the world. And you're They're telling just me extremism's bad guys. over. Do you appreciate the efforts of Tasheeh al Mafahim, the correction of understandings? that happened with uh, Jama'is the male absolutely, renounced absolutely, complete terrorism? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. What but I was going to say... And you still would draw a conclusion there is one, failure? What I was going to say is I want to thank briefly, the Doha debates. Briefly. Yes? This is the first time I'm actually on a forum like this. I've been cited in many media. I've been cited in almost 22 media outlets in the last four months. I'm saying this is the first time somebody has asked me to discuss this very issue. And I hope with the 200 million audience that you have or whatever staggering number of audience that you have that the world will begin to see the work that Muslims are doing. And I do really ask you to vote for this side All because right. there are many of us doing this work and you don't want to disempower us. We're going to take a final question from the lady in the fourth row there. You have your hand up. That's you. Yes. I was wondering, do you... Do you want us to apologize for all of these statistics? Because I feel what you're trying to say is that we should apologize for what's going on, even though I think that by doing so, it's pretty much us taking the blame for what's going on. What I'm trying to say is that, unfortunately, to people who are undereducated or ignorant about Islam, they see Islam as a monolith. They think all Muslims are Arabs, all Arabs are Muslims, vice versa. Com complete fallacies about Islam. And I think that it is our duty to educate. And so when, when I quote statistics like this, I think that we are not doing enough in order to combat this miseducation, this misinformation, and Islamophobia, blatant Islamophobia that is going on. Let me just put the question to Ed Hussein. Do you want Muslims to apologize? Apology isn't enough. We need Muslims to rectify. We need Muslims to put an end to extremism. And it's not about apologizing and then everything's back to normal. It's about admitting that we have a problem. And I think that's where passing the motion in favor tonight puts our colors to the mask and says, Muslims in the heart of the Middle East, here in Doha, in Qatar, realize, recognize, admit that we have a deep, deep problem. And it's from this point onwards that we commit globally in the, in the public space to solving it. And uh, you know, apologies, you know, jolly good, but let's get beyond apologies and get to real action. You, well, you wanted to come back on that. Yeah, isn't it kind of like taking the blame, though? Because I know that roughly 2% of the two billion Muslims out there are the ones with these extremist views and stuff. But, um, like... There, there's collective German guilt for the Holocaust 60 years later after it's happened. I, I, I Wait, so, uh, demographics have taken collective guilt. I'm not saying that it is our responsibility, but it does become our responsibility 
that when, when co-religionists of ours claim to use our faith in order to spring from their own perverted political agendas, it is our duty to reclaim that, and that is why that we need to all vote for the motion. All right, tonight. ladies Thanks. and gentlemen, we've come to the point in the proceedings we're going to vote on the motion that this House believes that Muslims are failing to combat extremism. Would you please take your voting machines? If you want to vote for the motion, that is the side represented by Ed Hussein and Asalan Iftika, please press button one, the yellow one. If you want to vote against the motion, that is the side represented by Daisy Khan and Moez Masood, would you press button two, the red one, and would you please do that now? You only have to press the button once, and then through the miracles of modern science, your vote will be transmitted to the computers. All right. There's the figure on the screen. Seventy point four percent for the motion, twenty nine point six against the motion has been resoundingly carried. All it remains for me to do is to thank our distinguished speakers for coming here tonight. You've come a long way. And thank you, and thank you to you, the audience, for your questions. The Doha debates will be back again next month. Till then, from all of us on the team, have a safe journey home. Good night. Thank you.